Okay, we want to talk about one other uh, woman who may not have actually drawn these, but is certainly the inspiration, and in this case we're fairly certain that it was the nuns at her convent uh, that illustrated uh, her uh, book. Um, this uh, learned abbess is Herard of Landsberg, or sometimes called Herard of Horenberg. Um, her dates, we don't know of course her birth date, but uh, somewhere maybe around 1130 uh, to 1195. And she was the abbess of the Horenberg convent in Alsace. Now Alsace is that section that's today France that's right next to Germany. <laughs> And at this time, as you see from the name Horenberg, um, it would have, we would have thought of it as more as German territory. Um, but, you know, for different wars, it goes back and forth. So one of the things I know that sometimes people think is really odd is I'll say, okay, uh, an artist, for example, 15th century, um, Martin Schoengauer is from Colmar in Alsace, and Alsace, oh, he's German. Because, but that's France. But it was German. Um, and of course, the countries weren't laid out quite the way they are now. You're talking about the languages they spoke and things like that. Now, what Hildegard did was write a volume, the Horus Deliciarum, uh, the Garden of Delights. The Hortus, Hortus is garden. Um, and this, of course, would take several years, so around 1180. What it is, is a compendium of sacred and historical texts that she's put together um, probably for teaching purposes within her convent. Uh, we're pretty sure that it was illustrated by the nuns in her scriptorium. Alas, it is destroyed. Um, the bombardment of Salzburg in 1870 uh, lit. <laughs> um, there was a fire, and um, manuscripts and uh, documents were destroyed. However, it had been copied by hand previously, of a colored copy, and from these copies, line engrav engravings were made, and they were published, uh, as you can see, some years uh, after the manuscript was actually destroyed. I happen to have bought a reprint of that, uh, of that um, book, and so it's very interesting looking at all of these pictures. Um, I, I didn't try to have all of them scanned. Uh, one of the things that I thought was really interesting, and it was, it was very, very faint, so it would have been hard to have uh, scanned it, but uh, there's actually uh, some classical images, Ulysses and the Sirens. Uh, are in there given a Christian interpretation. So I thought that was quite interesting. Most of these things, of course, are Christian, just that sticks in there. Okay, she has a, a dedication in it, and uh, she has this wonderful um, metaphor uh, that she's a little bee. <laughs> I make it known to your holiness that, like a little bee inspired by God, I collected from the various flowers of sacred scripture and philosophic writings this book which is called the Hortus Deliciara, and I brought it together to the praise and honor of Christ and the Church, and for the sake of your love, as, as if uh, into a single sweet honeycomb." So um, she's a little bee, she's gathering up all of these wonderful writings from sacred scripture, from philosophy, from uh, wherever she's getting it, and she's putting them together. Uh, in what we would call a compendium, which she calls a honeycomb, so it has lots of little parts uh, to it. It does show a high level of theological knowledge. Everything from the Bible, from Scripture, to the most recent 12th century theologians. So Herard was really, uh, seems, to, seems to be a learned lady, uh, right up to date with what was being, being written. It is written in Latin, but there are some glosses or commentaries that are in German. And so it's been suggested that this uh, very lo logically would be used for teaching, for study, and meditation at the convent. And uh, you know, maybe even helping some of the novices who haven't quite completely mastered Latin, so you have little German glosses there. Um, it also includes poetry and hymns 
uh, and even some that have musical notations, uh, which is very new at this time. There are 334 illustrations. Over 130 of them are full-page color illustrations. Now, some of my pictures will be color, and those would have been taken from the copy. And you'll see the copy is pretty close, uh, which makes a certain amount of sense because I think the engravings are taken from that color copy. They're just done in line. And then I have some that don't have color in them, and these were from that uh, uh, 1879 to 99 publication, which has been reprinted. You can see her respect for philosophy and the seven liberal arts. And uh, here we see a, uh, an image with uh, philosophy at the center. She's crowned uh, with uh, descriptions say ethic, logic, and physic. Uh, at her feet, still in the center uh, circle, are Socrates and Plato. Don't anyone tell you that uh, they didn't know anything about uh, classical philosophy during the Middle Ages. Um, there were just some limits to what they knew. For example, Plato's um, there was only one volume of Plato that was known in the West, and that was the Timaeus, but his reputation was high, and Neoplatonism was well known. Um, there are coming from philosophy seven streams. You see these sort of arcing out, and these represent the seven lib liberal arts who are then uh, in the next ring and in these uh, little uh, sort of horseshoe shaped arches uh, personified as uh, female figures. And then, at the bottom, there's uh, some people she doesn't approve of. They're outside the circle. These are poets and magicians of unclean spirit who try to fool you uh, rather than to enlighten you. And here we see it again, uh, both the uh, colored version that I found on the web and uh, the, uh, the line engraving. Um, so I pick some of these at random. This is uh, Leviathan caught by a hook. Okay, Leviathan, as you may remember, is, uh, a, uh, is mentioned in Job. And uh, sometimes people talk about uh, the whale, you know, Jonah and the Leviathan also, uh, but uh, not necessarily. In, uh, art, uh, in early Christian art, uh, Leviathan with Jonah is usually represented as a kind of sea serpent. Uh, here we just have some kind of um, hybrid monster uh, with a big mouth and uh, a wonderful curly tail. And uh, so basically a big sea creature. And in Job 42.1 it says, can you, pull in the can you pull in the Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down his tongue with a rope? And of course human beings can't do that, but God can control all. So this becomes a kind of Christian metaphor by interpretation, and here we have a sort of visual interpretation of that. Uh, we have Christ as a fisherman, uh, and on his <laughs> fish hook, um, we see the genealogy of Christ uh, represented in little heads, and then at the bottom there is Christ incarnate on the cross. And you see, going down from the cross, there's a big fish hook that has gone through the jaw of, of the Leviathan. So here, Leviathan is symbolized is the symbol of the devil, of evil. And he's caught on the hook of the cross. Have you ever heard the term gadzooks? That's a swear word. You may not have known it, but it's kind of a contraction for God's hooks. In those cases, the hooks are the nails. Uh, in this case, it literally made it into a uh, fish hook, or a leviathan hook, I guess. Um, what does this mean? Huh? Well, the idea, and this goes back to St. Augustine, that by incarnating, by God taking on flesh, he was able to trick Satan and destroy him. Because Satan would never have dreamed that God would actually come into human flesh. So the human flesh hides the divinity of Christ from you know, profane eyes of Satan. Um, and it's a trick, in a sense, because he has incarnated, is, is Christian doctrine, and uh, this leads to the destruction of Satan's powers because Christ's sacrifice on the cross atones for all of those sins of mankind and allows people to escape the realm of Satan, hell, and uh, 
go to heaven eventually, hopefully. So, as I said, we have the, the, the busts of the patriarchs that represent the genealogy of Christ. Uh, so Christ is hiding his divine nature in their flesh. And then we have our Christ on the cross as a hook. The composition was what uh, drew me in at first, though. Uh, I just thought it was so unusual, uh, with all that empty space. Um, I always admire people who know when to stop. <laughs> That's uh, just a you know, really unique composition uh, with the, the strong verticality. And it, it tells the story symbolically very, very clearly.